Welcome to this episode of Revolution Ideology. I'm Nick. I'm Jared. In this episode, we are continuing our series on nihilism. So this is the third episode in the series. We started by talking about German idealism, uh, Fichte, Jacobi. Then the second episode was on fathers and sons and really the subculture of Russian nihilism, which we're kind of extending that conversation, talking more about Russian nihilism uh, here in this episode. Specifically in this episode, we're going to be talking about revolutionary uh, nihilism in Russia at uh, the time. So we're really picking up kind of where we left off. We left off talking about Ivan Turgenev's fathers and sons and how that basically gave a name to this movement. Um, he basically, if you remember, one of the characters in that uh, novel, uh, Bazarov was a self-proclaimed nihilist. And so if you didn't watch that uh, episode or listen to that, you can go back and do that and sort of catch up, uh, but not crucial to this episode. So Turgenev publishes Fathers and Sons and basically gives definition to the movement of what's going on. We can't, though, continue this conversation without talking about Nikolai Chernyshevsky, who's a Russian author, and his novel, What is to be Done?, this is like a landmark work of literature for so many reasons. Uh, we talked about the importance of father and sons. Uh, what is to be done is also incredibly, incredibly important. But it's important to note for our purposes here that he wrote it as a response to fathers and sons because he didn't think that Bazarov was nihilist enough, basically. So he thought that Turgenev's portrayal of the nihilist in fathers and sons didn't go far enough, that he wasn't as extreme as he should have been. You have something to say? I was just going to ask, since you've done the research on this, was this tied mm -hmm. to the love story part of this, where there are like kind of some doubt that like a little bit of doubt cast on like the nihilist lens. In, oh, because he fathers, fell in love. Yeah, yeah, in fathers and sons, I'm saying. Is that where some of the, the when he starts casting doubt mm -hmm. on this philosophy, is that like the critique? No, actually, no. Okay. He just thought that uh, it wasn't nihilist enough, basically. Not because he falls in love, but because... Chernyshevsky takes it to another level where it's fully, uh, they denounce like any aesthetic, right? So like the value of art and poetry and so forth, like that's all super important to Chernyshevsky and his view of nihilism. So he takes it to like the next level, basically. Not Through specifically. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, he was actually like an economist and a I'm philosopher messing, and et cetera, and yeah, also yeah. wrote this novel that happened to be you got a little incredibly important. Somehow. Yeah, yeah <laughs> exactly. Um, so I'm just going to read the Wikipedia, a section from the Wikipedia entry on what is to be done, because this isn't about what is to be done, but it is so important that we need to talk about it a little bit. So I'm not going to do a whole synopsis or anything, but I'm just going to read this excerpt from the Wikipedia page. Um, so what is to be done is an 1863 novel written by Russian philosopher, journalist, and literary critic Nikolai Chernyshevsky, written in response to Fathers and Sons, which was written in 1862 by Ivan Turgenev. The chief character is Vera Pavlovna, a woman who escapes the control of her family in an arranged marriage to seek economic independence. The novel advocates the creation of small socialist cooperatives based on the Russian peasant commune, but one that is oriented towards industrial production. The author promoted the idea that the intellectual's duty was to educate and lead the laboring masses in Russia along a path to socialism that bypassed capitalism. The book's framework takes place through a story of a privileged couple who decide to work for the revolution and ruthlessly subordinate everything in their lives to the cause. As such, the work furnished a blueprint for the asceticism and dedication unto death that became an ideal of the early socialist underground of the Russian Empire. Despite his minor role, Rakhmatov, one of the characters in the novel, became an emblem of the philosophical materialism and nobility of Russian radicalism. Through one character's dream, the novel also expresses a society gaining eternal joy of an earthly kind. Um, so this character, Rakhmatov, if you know anything about what is to be done or Russian literature, etc., like it says here, became sort of just like Bizarrov became the symbol of nihilism, etc. Rakhmatov becomes the symbol of like what it means to be a materialist revolutionary, etc., dedicated to this cause in Chernyshevsky's work. It's often said in like... 
uh, philosophy and academia surrounding this work that like Marx's Kapital was really sort of the economic and political inspiration for the Russian Revolution. And Chernyshevsky's What is to be Done was really the emotional inspiration. Hugely, hugely influential book. Um, a massive inspiration of Lenin. And if you know anything about Lenin and his work, he actually named his work What is to be Done very clearly, obviously, after Chernyshevsky's novel, uh, what is to be done. So Chernyshevsky basically takes it to the next level. Uh, that's enough for what is to be done. Even though I thought about doing an entire episode on what is to be done, but we already did an entire episode on fathers and sons, and like we can really only spend so much time talking about Russian literature before uh, I just get bored with it. Um, if you remember last time, also we mentally, briefly mentioned Dmitry Pisarev. He was a critic and a philosopher who celebrated while many people were denigrating and critiquing fathers and sons, he celebrated fathers and sons and Bizarov and uh, Turgenev's depiction of the nihilists and basically said that Bizarov was an ideal that everyone should really work towards. Um, he was an incredibly important thinker, Pizarov was in his time. Uh, I only mentioned him briefly because we're going to come back to him uh, in a few minutes. Um, when anti-nihilism sort of as a movement starts, some people begin to uh, critique uh, Pizarov and his ideas. So there's really kind of three sort of buckets in the Russian nihilist movement. There's the Russian subculture overall that Turgenev really puts a label on in Fathers and Sons. And underneath that, there's kind of three categories. Uh, first is the by far the majority of the nihilists who were really uh, into rationality, science, positivism, etc., materialism, and they were largely apolitical. They believed that politics was kind of socially outdated and really like useless, and that participating it in it was just a complete waste of time. That's the vast majority, uh, by far, of the Russian nihilists. Um, then we have the kind of a middle ground that some of the nihilists did participate in politics to some extent to challenge the status quo. Remember, they're all about freedom and negation. So they would, uh, in some way, whatever that looked like for them, would be involved in politics. And then finally, we have the revolutionary nihilists, which is our focus here today, that believed essentially that any action which challenged the status quo, whose goal, which goal was to destroy the status quo, uh, was acceptable. Now, this is by far the smallest sliver of like the nihilist subculture in Russia, but they garnered the most attention very clearly because of the actions that they carried out. Uh, so if we're looking at the propaganda of the deed, it works in this case because they become inc incredibly, incredibly well-known and influential still to this day, which we'll talk about. Uh, something to add? No, no. I'm going to, like, inspiration for the Black Army during the Civil War, um, mm -hmm. but you're not there yet, so yep. that's what I was going to include. But Okay, yeah. cool. Um, we talked about Michael Gillespie in the last episode. He wrote a book titled Nihil Nihilism Before Nietzsche, which is really like canon sort of in the nihilist work uh, academic sphere anyways. Uh, but he says their principal aim, talking about the revolutionary nihilists, was negation that aimed at liberating man's Promethean powers. Um, I've actually seen this mentioned a lot lately, talking about uh, movements that are Promethean in nature. Do you know who Prometheus was and what he did? I'm assuming you do in Greek mythology. I don't remember because you're putting me on the spot right now. Okay, uh, I didn't know I was, before in, I looked it up. Brain, so. In my brain, I'm now looking up the Black Army. So like, like yeah. This, okay, so anyway. I didn't know either before I looked it up. He was a demigod, demigod in Greek mythology who created mortals and then gave them fire and then got punished by Zeus for doing so. So how this applies to like a movement, specifically the nihilist, is they believe that human beings can be emboldened if the social order was destroyed. That essentially that's how they will be liberated, essentially stealing fire from the gods, which Prometheus did uh, for the mortals in this, uh, uh, this, this myth. Uh, so Gillespie says this, quote, this Promethean view of human freedom established a moral imperative for the radicals. If history is driven by powers beyond human control, as Marx had argued, then no one is really responsible for or obligated to do anything about the evil in the world. If, on the contrary, man is free to shape his own destiny, then revolutionary activity is a moral duty. 
dedication to revolution thus became the highest moral imperative and commitment to the cause absolved all personal failings. So this last sentence is really a good summary of the uh, Russian revolutionary nihilist movement. Dedication to the revolution became the highest moral imperative and commitment to the cause absolved all personal failings. Okay, the Russian, the, rev the revolutionary nihilist movement is typically said to have begun with Sergei Nietzscheev's publication of his pamphlet, Catechism of a Revolutionary, in 1869. A catechism, if you're wondering what this term is, uh, is basically a summary of principles. Um, he's sort of, Sergei Nietzscheev is sort of the poster boy for revolutionary nihilism because he writes this pamphlet. We're going to talk about the pamphlet in a second. There's really no better work that describes what exactly it means to be a revolutionary nihilist than this pamphlet. And so, like I said, it's really say, it's really pointed to that, like, in 1869, with the formal publication of this pamphlet, is really the, the origin, the demarcation, when we talk about the revolutionary uh, sort of wing of the Russian nihilist uh, movement. So let's talk about this pamphlet and what it means. We're going to go through and break it down. But before we do that, we have to talk about the connection to Mikhail Bakunin. Um, if you've never heard of Mikhail Bakunin, he's a super uh, famous Russian philosopher at the time, uh, anarchist. We actually have an episode yep. going through a few bullets, just quotes from him talking about his philosophies, uh, etc., and things like that. He's kind of the window originally that kind of led us both down, like even researching this path. Obviously, Nick is the mm -hmm. sociologist a little bit more my than myself, but like Bakunin definitely was like that, that... I don't know, lightning rod that kind of got us interested. Mm -hmm. I don't even know how many years ago that was at this point, maybe 10 years ago at this point. Yeah. So we started researching him and that's where we, of course, we went back, Nick went back and looked at some of the philosophies that led to him. And then of course I looked some of, at some of the philosophies that, that, that were inspired by him. But he's really, at least for me, maybe not even for you, mm -hmm. but for me, it was the lightning rod. Like that was the first thing I read was his version or his type of revolutionary catechism. Yeah, which we're about to talk about. And then the review and those types of things and mm -hmm. how that influenced others. So yep. that, that was that's where I started was with him. I mean, Bakunin is really the first First, he's he's really usually pointed to as the first revolutionary anarchist. Um, others like Proudhon was like he's a gradualist. He thought that this change yeah. would take place over time. Bakunin was really the first revolutionary, and many people actually point to him as the first revolutionary nihilist. Uh, you mentioned his famous quote, which I'll paraphrase because I don't remember exactly, but like the urge to destroy is also a creative urge, something like that. Uh, so because of some of his writings at the time, the same time when all this is happening. Um, he gets pointed to sometimes as the first uh, revolutionary nihilist. But going back to Nietzscheev's Catechism of a Revolutionary, there is still to this day much academic debate on how much Bakunin helped Nietzscheev write Catechism of a Revolutionary, which is even more confusing because Bakunin himself had written a work titled Revolutionary Catechism. So we have Bakunin's Revolutionary Catechism and Nietzscheev's Catechism of a Revolutionary. Um, I'm going to read just a brief excerpt. I'll read a couple points from Bakunin's Revolutionary Catechism. He says, Replacing the cult of God by respect and love of humanity, we proclaim human reason as the only criterion of truth, human conscience as the basis of justice, individual and collective freedom as the only source of order in society. Freedom is the absolute right of every adult man and woman to seek no other sanction for their acts than their own conscience and their own reason being responsible first to themselves and then to the society which they have voluntarily accepted, and so forth. We're not going to do the whole thing, but you get the idea of what Bakunin is after. Now, I have a quote here uh, from Sam Dolgoff's book, Bakunin on Anarchy. And if you've read any anarchism at all, you've heard of Sam uh, Dolgoff. He's an uh, anarchist scholar that writes uh, many things, um, or wrote many things. So he writes this in the intro to Bakunin's revolutionary catechism he writes this uh, as the introduction quote in 1864 bakunin founded the secret international revolutionary association better known as the international fraternity which published its program and statutes in 1865 to 1866 in three related documents the international family the revolutionary catechism and the national catechism in which bakunin outlined the basic tenets of his doctrine 
The revolutionary catechism is primarily concerned with the immediate practical problems of the revolution. It was meant to sketch out for new and prospective members of the international fraternity but both the fundamental libertarian principles and a program of action. These texts are the least known and most important of Bakunin's writings. They should not be confused with the rules that should inspire a revolutionist, written much later in 1869 during Bakunin's brief association with the young radical nihilist Sergei Nietzscheev. So, there's no definitive proof uh, as to whether Bakunin wrote all, some, or none of Nietzscheev's essay, Catechism of a Revolutionary, but Bakunin and Nietzscheev did know each other, and it's generally agreed that Bakunin did probably help Nietzscheev write some of the ideas featured within Catechism of a Revolutionary. So there's a connection to Bakunin there. Though Bakunin distanced himself from the pamphlet and Nietzscheev uh, as an individual uh, later on. He basically was disgusted with Nietzscheev's enactment of these uh, beliefs. Um, so it helps to think of Bakunin's Revolutionary Catechism as the suggested principles of the revolution as a movement and Nietzscheev's Catechism of a Revolutionary as the suggested principles of an individual revolutionary in the movement. So Nietzscheev's are really, and you'll see when we get to them in a second, they're individual directives of how an individual should behave, etc. Whereas Bakunin's more of like a philosophical doctrine that should be followed. Um, okay, anything to add before we start breaking down Nietzscheev's Catechism? No, because like I said, I think that the interesting leap for me is like uh, the material influence on mm -hmm. Nestor Mack now, and that's kind of what I, wanna, what I wanted to talk a little okay. bit about in the formation of the Black Army. So this is broken up in three different sections. I'm not going to read all of these. There's in this uh, version 26 total paragraphs, uh, little bullets. I'm not going to read all of them. We're just going to go through. But the three sections are the duties of the revolutionary toward himself, the relations of the revolutionary toward his comrades, and the relations of the revolutionary toward society. So number one, uh, the duties of the revolutionary towards himself. He says, the revolutionary is a doomed man. He has no personal interests, no business affairs, no emotions, no attachments, no property, and no name. Everything in him is wholly absorbed in the single thought and the single passion for revolution. The revolutionary knows that in the very depths of his being, not only in, in words, but also in deeds, he has broken all the bonds which tie him to the social order and the civilized world with its laws, moralities, and customs, and with all its generally accepted conventions. He is their implacable enemy, and if he continues to live with them, it is only in order to destroy them more speedily. The revolutionary despises all doctrines and refuses to accept the mundane sciences, leaving them for future generations. He knows only one science, the science of destruction. For this reason, but only for this reason, he will study mechanics, physics, chemistry, and perhaps medicine. But all day and all night he studies the vital science of human beings, their characteristics and circumstances, and all the phenomena of the present social order. The object is, to perpetu is perpetually the same, the surest and quickest way of destroying the whole filthy order. The revolutionary despises public opinion. He despises and hates the existing social morality in all its manifestations. For him, morality is everything which contributes to the triumph of the revolution. Immoral and criminal is everything that stands in the way. The revolutionary can have no friendship or attachment, except for those who have proved their, by their actions that they, like him, are dedicated to revolution. The degree of friendship, devotion, and obligation towards such a comrade is determined solely by the degree of his usefulness to the cause of total revolutionary destruction. It is superfluous to speak of solidarity among revolutionaries. The whole strength of revolutionary work lies in this. Comrades who possess the same revolutionary passion and understanding should, as much as possible, deliberate all important matters together and come to unanimous conclusions. When the plan is finally decided upon, the revolutionary must rely solely on himself. In carrying out acts of destruction, each one should, each one should act alone, never running to one another for advice and assistance except when these are necessary for the furtherance of the plan. When a comrade, this one's kind of important because it actually plays out in his life. When a comrade is in danger and the question arises whether he should be saved or not saved, the decision must not be arrived at on the basis of sentiment, but solely in the interests of the revolutionary cause. Therefore, it is necessary to weigh carefully the usefulness of the comrade against the expenditure of revolutionary forces necessary to save him 
and the decision must be made according, accordingly. This is important because Nietzsche finds himself in prison and the movement starts to put together plans to free him and he actually contacts them and says no, it wouldn't be worth it to free me. Instead, use the resources of the movement to assassinate the, the Tsar. And if you know anything about the history of the Russian Revolutionary Nihilist Movement, they actually do succeed uh, after many attempts in assassinating uh, the Tsar, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, just a couple of more. The, this is the relations of the revolutionary towards society. Number 12, the new member, having given proof of his loyalty, not by words, but by deeds, can receive into the society only by the unanimous agreement of all members. Aiming at an implacable revolution, the revolutionary may and frequently must live within society while pretending to be completely different from what he is. For he must penetrate everywhere, into all higher and middle classes, into the houses of commerce, the churches and the palaces of the aristocracy, and into the worlds of bureaucracy and literature and the military, and also into the third division and the winter palace of the czar. Um, then he goes through different categories of people that are in the movement. So he says... Um, the fifth category consists of these doctrinaires, conspirators, and revolutionists who cut a great figure on the paper or in their cliques. They must be constantly driven to make compromising declarations. As a result, the majority of them will be destroyed, while a minority will become gen genuine revolutionaries. The sixth category is especially important, women. They can be divided into three main groups. First, those frivolous, thoughtless, and vapid women whom we shall uh, use as we use the third category and fourth category of men. Second, the women who are ardent, capable, and devoted, but whom do not belong to us because they have not yet achieved a passionless and austere revolutionary understanding. These must be used like the men of the fifth category. Finally, there are women who are completely on our side, i.e. those who are wholly dedicated and who have accepted our program in its entirety. We should regard these women as the most valuable of our treasures. Without their help, we would never succeed. So a little uh, chauvinism there, but I don't think that anyone would be surprised. Um, also, I want to just correct myself. I said there are three categories in this. There's actually four. The fourth category is the attitude of the society toward the people. The society, and when he's saying society here, he's saying society like the secret society of the revolutionaries. The society has no aim other than the complete liberation and happiness of the masses, i.e. of the people who live by manual labor. Convinced that their emancipation and the achievement of this happiness can only come about as a result of an all-destroying popular revolt. The society will use all its resources and energy toward increasing and intensifying the evils and miseries of the people until at last their patience exhausted and they are driven to general uprising. To weld the people into a single unconquerable and all-destructive force this is our aim, our conspiracy, and our task. All right, so you can read through the rest of it on your own. Like I said, it's only 26, basically, uh, paragraphs. Um, thoughts at this point? Uh, no, I was going to, like I said, I was going to add in some of the application of these ideas, but I don't know. I think we can go a little bit further in the philosophy first. No, go ahead. About the application. Do that. So, like, in terms of the application regarding the revolutionary, like, the best example we can come up with, and it comes from a little bit later day, is, is a man named uh, Nestor. Uh, Mach now most people know him he's like a very famous anarchist but he took a lot of these ideas to heart long story short he was a peasant suffered under the czarist regime witnessed numerous attempts on the czar's life dating all the way back to 1905 even joined some like revolutionary cells ends up in jail and in jail this is where he is influenced by like thinkers that we're talking about here by like this like revolutionary nihilism he starts to read about and he doesn't even really read about it he's actually kind of taught about it in prison and after of course the first successful um, revolution in February of 1917, he ends up released. And that's where he organizes um, what it, he's released and he ends up in Ukraine. And that's where he organizes what is known as the Black Army, formerly called the Revolutionary Insurrectionary Army, to create the Ukrainian Free State, which a lot of people don't know existed. It was like very short lived, like, like 1917 to 1921 before uh, the Red Army ends up crushing them. They're former allies, actually, the Red and the Black Army against the White Army. But, like, it's in here that we kind of see, like, this idea come to fruition through these actions. So he would lead, like, these roving bands of, like, peasant revolts where they would basically take land wholesale, like, just, like, um, from, the, from the estates redistribute it to the peasants. He became kind of like a Robin Hood, a Russian Robin Hood type figure. But like the nihilist part of this is that there was, it was completely like 
I guess what the word I'm looking for is annihilation of everything around them. Like mm-hmm. it just didn't matter as long as like the the new resources would be distributed equally among the people, especially in Ukraine. He wasn't a Ukrainian nationalist by any stretch of imagination, although people in like modern times have kind of tried to frame him that way. He was a straight up anarchist. He did not believe in the state at all. All of his most famous publications that he wrote later were against the state. To give you an example of like the correlation, here's a thought from Nestor Machno that like reminds me eerily of what you were just talking about. The more a man becomes aware through a reflection of his servile condition, the more indignant he becomes, the more the anarchist spirit of freedom, determination, and action waxes inside him. That's true of every individual, man or woman, even though they may never have heard the word anarchism before. So it's kind of like this idea, this awakening, this leaving of Plato's cave that we like to, that that, uh, allegory we like to use quite often. But the difference, I think, between Machno and some of the other individuals that we've talked about is his is the application. Um, He actually does this. Mm wholesale throughout Ukraine. Um, long story short, without going through the whole man, like his entire life, he eventually does help the Bolshevik Red Army and Trotsky and all those individuals defeat the White Army, as well as, people forget, the Allied forces from World War One that also went to help the White Army and maintain the Tsarist regime in, in Russia so it wouldn't become the Soviet Union. He plays a major role there. Unfortunately, because of the label free territory or Ukrainian free state, eventually the Red Army is going to turn on him and argue that he has organized a a form of governance in contrast to the Soviet Union. And that's what they're going to use to eventually crush him in turn. He's able to flee and he, and he dies um, basically in exile in Paris. But I think Machno, and we'll probably do a little bit more on his life because he's super interesting to me. But anyway, I think he kind of frames this era of Russian history and philosophy in action. And I think that's that's something we need to. No, it's awesome. Here. So, Nietzscheev himself, and like many other members, clearly of the revolutionary movement, like I said, they're they're all about propaganda of the deed. So, it's not just that he writes this work and like that's all he ever does. He writes this work and then he like lives it out. As a result, he was kind of a shitty human being. People say like lied, cheated, stealed, right, etc. He, in fact, murdered, uh, was responsible for the murder of a person that was in his movement, um, etc. So, and like we were talking about, right, the nihilists uh, actually do eventually assassinate the czar after many attempts, right, with homemade bombs, etc. They finally do succeed. They bomb his train and all kinds of stuff. They finally do succeed uh, in 1881. That's czar Alexander II, which we actually mentioned briefly in the previous episode, where we said that was actually a setback for the liberation of Russia uh, overall. Because while he wasn't like overly progressive, he was much more progressive than uh, what would come next. Um, but anyway, that's uh, not really relevant to what we're talking about here. Um, so yeah, Nietzsche really like acts these things out, which is why he ends up in prison. Um, and in fact, he dies in prison. So uh, yeah, that's it, he dies. Uh, so, as you can imagine by what we've described and what we read from Nietzsche, the Russian nihilist movement basically is willing to do and excuse any behavior and action that serves the revolution. However, we're going to talk about this more in depth in a second, but they get a bad rap because people like, you know, you think of a nihilist and you think a nihilist is someone without any morals or a nihilist who is someone who believes that nothing matters. Neither of those are true for the Russian nihilists, the revolutionary nihilists, in an interesting way. They do have morals, but the moral, the only thing that is moral for them is the revolution and its actions. And they don't believe in any action being valuable, but only actions that serve the revolution. So many people often think like, well, they're just out like bombing children. Like they would never do that because that doesn't function to serve the revolution. Now, we might get in some ethical gray areas If they believe that bombing of children somehow did serve the revolution, they perhaps might do that. But there's no examples of that really happening throughout history where they like bombed an elementary school or something because it served the revolution. Like that's never happened. But that's why I use the Machno examples because uh, this is what, a few decades after what you're talking about here, especially with the peasant insurrections in Ukraine where they are burning down like manors and whatnot Mm -hmm. with like no regard for what's going on around them. Exactly the context of revolution and perhaps world war one as well and like mm-hmm. just like the dehumanization that had yeah. like that alters like the discourse right there 100 percent, so. yeah as a result of the action of the nihilists an anti-nihilist movement arises as you might imagine people are not okay with this and so first 
uh, the, the czar, like we talked about, is assassinated. So in politically in Russia, uh, they start to take some action. So prominent radical journals are banned and some other anti-revolutionary policies are enacted. So at the political level, they start to battle uh, the Russian nihilist movement. Re they start to react. Um, then very interestingly, the anti-nihilist novel as a genre uh, s s emerges. Um, and Dostoevsky is the most prominent figure in the anti-nihilist novel movement. I mean, it's really interesting. I didn't know anything about this specific aspect of Dostoevsky's work until I started reaching, researching this uh, very deeply. But he publishes his novel Notes from the Underground as a direct response to Chernyshevsky's What is to be Done. And he satirizes the entire thing. Um, then he publishes Crime and Punishment as a direct response to Dmitry Pizzarev's some of his writing. Then the main character in his novel Demons, or sometimes referred to uh, as The Possessed, is modeled specifically, the protagonist, after Sergei Nietzscheev. So basically Dostoevsky writes all of these novels and he's in there basically shitting on the nihilist movement and nihilism as a philosophy, at least revolutionary nihilism, um, and so forth. So it's just kind of interesting that both politically they start reacting and trying to squash the nihilist movement. And then and we know the importance of Russian literature, right? The anti-nihilist novel as a genre in Russian literature emerges uh, largely through Dostoevsky, but through other really prominent authors as well to satirize, mock, etc., the nihilist uh, movement. So, so just like we talk about in, in, in other episodes regarding like the transmission of ideas, like through pop culture, and in this case, like literature is that pop yep. culture, that's exponentially more powerful than, 100%. Than, than political treatises or speeches or what have yeah. you. Like people, I mean... <laughs> I mean, I guess we're mocking like, you know, Marx and Engels here, but had they written maybe a novel? Uh, my, yeah. yeah. I mean, Who rather knows? than, yeah. Technically, Marx did write a novel. Yeah. One of the first things he ever wrote. I've never read it, but apparently it's not good, but I've always <laughs> wanted to. Like when he was young, young, like in college, right. he wrote like a novel. But but I mean, in terms of like socialization and what we always talk about, the ethically constitutive story, like like the delivery of entertaining while socializing mm -hmm. works so much better. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we have to like question really like... Right. This is a perfect example, right? Was Lenin more radicalized by reading what is to be done or by reading Capital and other things that Marx had written? Who knows? But yeah, like we'll never what know. he specifically, what is to be done specifically inspira inspired him to a great degree, right? And if we're talking about the general public, well, for fathers sure. and sons even before that, we just yeah, did the episode, 100%. right? So. Mm -hmm. And yeah, as far as the general public is concerned, the novels were far more influential than any of the philosophical treatises that were created or in the pamphlets, et cetera, right? So for sure. Um, Yeah, I like this quote from uh, Michael Gillespie again in his Nihilism Before Nietzsche. He says, Nietzscheev's vision of the revolutionary horrified not merely the conservatives and liberals, but most revolutionaries themselves. The populists thought him a monster, and even Bakunin was disgusted when he saw their ideas carried out in all their intrinsic ruthlessness. So uh, you just get an idea of how people reacted to the Russian revolution, uh, nihilist, revolutionary nihilist movement. However... I can't sort of leave us without saying that they were effective. Like they assassinated the czar and so many people had tried, so many people had tried to some action to like, brother like tried. yeah, it's after, exactly. That's a perfect example actually. Yeah. yeah. They succeeded. Right. Um, kind of interesting. So it's a result of the actions of the revolutionary nihilists and the anti nihilist movement that nihilism overall still to this day has somewhat negative connotations. At least this was the origin of that sentiment. Um, as Jared mentioned in the previous episode, it's really fathers and sons and the general subculture of Russian nihilism that shapes how we view nihilism to this day. It is specifically the Russian nihil revolutionary nihilists that cause people today to view nihilism as violent and absent of morals and so on. So if you uh, go to someone and say, you know, what do you think of nihilism? And they say, oh, they're just like violent and amoral. That's d a direct lineage of the revolutionary nihilists in Russia at this time. Regardless of like, like more traditional, like political ideologies, right? Mm -hmm. Like, like, like even the Machno example that I too briefly described earlier, like even the communists thought that too, like revolutionary. Like, yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. The, 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 the social, there's, 
this interesting intermingling between the nihilists and the socialists and et cetera, but it ends up with, you're correct, the socialists even think that the revolutionary nihilists are too extreme, yeah. right? Um, and all kinds of philosophical conflicts too, where like, um, because they're merely destroying for the sake of destroying, they're not building, some, building this society that we would like to see, um, et cetera. So to sum this up, Peter Kropotkin actually provides us with a good quote nice. in his Memoirs of a Revolutionist, which he writes in 1899. He says, quote, The movement is misunderstood in Western Europe. In the press, for example, nihilism is continually confused with terrorism. The revolutionary disturbance, which broke out in Russia toward the close of the reign of Alexander II and ended in the tragic death of the Tsar, is constantly described as nihilism. This, however, is a mistake. To confuse nihilism with terrorism is a wrong, as wrong as to confuse a philosophical movement like stoicism or positivism with a political movement such as, for example, republicanism. Terrorism was called into existence by certain special conditions of the political struggle at a given historical moment. It has lived and has died. It may revive and die out again. <clears throat> but nihilism has impressed its stamp upon the whole of life of the educated classes of Russia. And that stamp will be retained for many years to come. So Kropotkin basically says, it's unfair to label all nihilism to bucket that as terrorism because revolutionary nihilism is a very, very, very mi minor aspect of nihilism overall. And even the terroristic aspects of revolutionary nihilism are yet still a smaller uh, sliver of revolutionary nihilism. So Kropotkin basically says, it's just completely misconstrued altogether. We shouldn't confuse nihilism with terrorism or even violence or even lack of ethics uh, and so forth. All right. Any closing thoughts? No, not really. Uh, like I said, I mean, these the revolutionary nihilism and the synthesis with like Russian anarchism, I think, is a pretty good place mm -hmm. for us to leave off. I think. And like we have an episode coming up that'll be unrelated yeah. to the nihilism episode, but on the Russian Revolution specifically, uh, where we'll talk about some of these interminglings between the nihilists and the, the uh, socialists and etc. Uh, but the next episode, specifically in this series on nihilism, we are going to talk about Max Stirner. Um, and his work Ego and Its Own. And we're actually kind of going out of order chronologically, which I mentioned in the last episode. Really, Bakunin and Stirner are referred to as sort of the first nihilists and egoists, which is really interesting. So we'll do Stirner next time. Like I said, going a little bit uh, out of order. So find us online, revolutionandideology.com. Uh, if you want to support us, there are various ways you can find on our website, but you can also support us on Patreon. Thank you, thank you, thank you to our Patreon supporters. Yeah, uh, sure. You really inspire us to keep uh, doing this research and this work. I'm Nick. I'm Jared. Later.